uma produção WGBH Boston associada à Harvard University. Qual a coisa certa a fazer? Justice, com Michael Sandel. Today, I'd like to take... I'd like to consider the strongest objections to the idea that there are obligations of solidarity or membership. Then I want to see if those objections can be met successfully. One objection emerged in the discussion last time. Patrick said, well, if obligations flow from community membership and identity, we inhabit multiple communities, doesn't that mean that our obligations will sometimes conflict. So that's one possible objection. And then Rena said, these examples meant to bring out the moral force of solidarity and membership. Examples about parents and children about the French resistance fighter asked to bomb his own village and drawing back, about the airlift by Israel of Ethiopian Jews. These examples, they may be intuitively evocative, Rina said, but really they're pointing to matters of emotion, matters of sentiment, not true moral obligations. And then there were a number of objections not necessarily to patriotism as such, but to patriotism understood as an obligation of solidarity and membership beyond consent. This objection allowed that there can be obligations to the communities we inhabit, including obligations of patriotism, But this objection argued that all of the obligations of patriotism or of community or membership are actually based on liberal ideas and perfectly compatible with them. Consent, either implicit or explicit, or reciprocity. Julia Rothau, for example, on the website, said that liberalism can endorse patriotism as a voluntary moral obligation. Patriotism and familial love both fall under this category. Because after all, Julia points out, the Kantian framework allows people free reign to choose to express virtues such as these if they want to. So you don't need the idea of a non-voluntary particular moral obligation to capture the moral force of community values. Where's Julia? Okay, so did I summarize that, that fairly? There is action, Julia actually is in line with what Rawls says about this very topic. You weren't aware of that. You came up with it on your own. That's pretty good. Rawls says when he's discussing political obligation, he says it's one thing if someone runs for office, or enlists in the military. They're making a voluntary choice. But Rawls says, there is, I believe, no political obligation, strictly speaking, for citizens generally. Because it's not clear what is the requisite binding action and who has performed it. So Rawls acknowledges that for ordinary citizens, there is no political obligation except insofar as some particular citizen willingly, through an act of consent, undertakes or chooses such an obligation. That's in line with Julia's point. It's related to another objection that people have raised, which is it's perfectly possible to recognize particular obligations to one's family or to one's country, provided Honoring those obligations doesn't require you to violate any of the natural duties or requirements of universal respect for persons, qua persons. So that's consistent with the idea that we can choose, if we want to, to express a loyalty to our country or to our people or to our family, provided we don't do any injustice. 
within the framework, acknowledging the priority, that is, of the universal duties. The one objection that I, I didn't mention is the view of those who say that obligations of membership really are a kind of collective selfishness. Why should we honor them? Isn't it just a kind of prejudice? So what I'd like to do, perhaps if those of you who have agreed, who wrote and who have agreed to, defend, to press these objections, perhaps if you could gather down all together, we'll form a team as we did once before, and we'll see if you can respond to those who want to defend patriotism conceived as a communal obligation. Now, there were a number of people who argued in defense of patriotism as the communitarian view conceives it. So let me go down now and join the critics the critics of communitarianism, if there's a microphone that we could use somewhere. OK, thanks, Kate. Um, who, as, as the critics of patriotism, communal patriotism, gather their forces here? Um, Patrick, if you want to, you can join as well, or Rena. Others who have spoken or addressed this question are free to join in. But I would like to hear now from those of you who defend patriotism and defend it as a moral obligation that can't be translated back into purely consent-based terms, can't be translated into liberal terms. Where's A.J. Kumar? A.J., everybody seems to know you. All right, let's hear from A.J. You said, I, in the same way I feel I owe more to my family than to the general community, I owe more to my country than to humanity in general. Because my country holds a great stake in my identity, it is not prejudice for me to love my country unless it is prejudice for me to love my parents more than somebody else's. So, AJ, what would you say to this group? Stand up. I think that there's some fundamental moral obligation that comes from a communitarian responsibility to people and groups that form your identity. I mean, even, like, I'll give the example that, you know, there are a lot of things about our government right now that I'm not in favor of, but part of my identity is that America values a free society where we can object to certain things, and I think that's an expression of patriotism as well. And, you know, I, I go back to the parent example, or even at Harvard, I think, you know, I owe more to my roommates because they make up my identity than I do to the Harvard community as a whole. And I think that applies to our country because there are certain things that growing up here, yes, we can't choose it, we can't choose our parents, things like that, but it makes up part of our identity. Okay, who would like to take that on? Ike? Yeah, about the um, obligation to others simply by virtue of uh, being in their, their um, being influenced by them. I'm a German citizen, and if I had been born 80 years earlier, then I would have been a citizen of Nazi Germany. And for some reason, I just don't think that I would have to feel obligated uh, towards Germany um, because I had benefited from actions of Nazis. I mean, I guess my response to that would be you have hundreds of thousands of protesters in the United States right now who hold up signs that say peace is patriotic. And I'm sure there are people in this room who don't agree with that. I personally do. And I would say that they're strongly objecting to basically everything the Bush administration is doing right now, but they still consider themselves loving their country because they're furthering the cause of what they see as best for, for the country. And I tend to agree with that as a patriotic movement. Well, but how is that then? How do you still favor your country? How is that still patriotic? I mean, isn't that more a sentimental attachment? Where's the obligation there? Uh, yeah, not to bring this back to John Locke, but I'd like to bring this back to John Locke. So, <laughs> I mean, in his conception of, of um, you know, when people join society, there's, there's still some outlet. Like, if, you, if you're not satisfied with your society, you know, you do have a means of exit. Even though we had a lot of concerns about how you're born in it and it's not very feasible, he still provides that option. If we want to say that um, your obligation to society is a moral one, that means that prior to knowing exactly what that society is going to be like or what your position is going to be in that society, that means that you have a binding obligation to, like, 
a complete unknown body that, that could be, you know, completely foreign to all of your personal beliefs or, you know, what you would hold to be Do you correct. think that that kind of communal obligation or patriotism means writing the community a, a blank moral check? Basically, yeah. Like, I think that we can, you know, I think it's reasonable to say that um, as you grow and as you develop within that community that you acquire some type of obligation based on reciprocity, but to say that you have a moral obligation, I think, requires a, a stronger justification. Good. Who else? Anyone else like to address that? Uh, I guess we could say that you, you could argue that you're morally obliged to society by the fact that there is this reciprocity. I think um, it's, it's the idea that, you know, we participate in society, we pay our taxes, we vote. This is why we could say that we owe something to society. But beyond that, I don't think there's anything inherent in the fact that we are members of the society itself that we owe it anything. I think it's, it's insofar as, we, as the society gives us something, gives us protection, safety, security, then we owe the society something, but nothing beyond what we give the society. Who wants to take that on? Rahul? I don't, think we, I don't think we give the community a blank moral check in that sense. I think we only give it a blank moral check when we abdicate our sense of civic responsibility and when we say that the debate doesn't matter because patriotism is a vice. I think that patriotism is important because it gives us a sense of community, a sense of common civic virtue that we can engage and the issues, even if you don't agree with the way the government is acting, you can still love your country and hate the way it's acting. And I think because out of that love of country, um, you can debate with other people and have respect for their views, but still engage in the debate. If you just say that, you know, patriotism is a vice, you drop out of that debate and you, and you cede the ground to people who are more fundamentalist, who have a stronger view, and who may coerce the community. It, instead, we should engage the other members of the community on that same moral ground. Well, now, this, what, what we hear from AJ and Rahul is a very pluralistic, argumentative, critically-minded patriotism, whereas what we hear from Ike and the critics of patriotism here is the worry that to take patriotic obligation in a communal way, seriously, involves a kind of loyalty that doesn't let us just pick and choose among the beliefs or actions or, or practices of our country. What more, what's left of loyalty if all we're talking about, AJ and Rahul, if all we're talking about is loyalty to principles of justice that may happen to be embodied in our community or not, as the case may be, and if not, then we can, can reject its course. I don't know, I've sort of given a reply. I got carried away, I'm sorry. Who would like? <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. Yeah, I think that patriotism, you need to define what that is. It sounds like you, know, you would normally think that we are given a more weak definition here of patriotism amongst us, but it almost sounds like your definition is merely to have some sort of civic involvement in debating within your society. And I think that that kind of undermines maybe the moral, some of the moral worth of patriotism as a virtue as well. I, I think if you can consent to a stronger form of patriotism if you want, that's a stronger, I guess, moral obligation than even what you're suggesting. What we really need to sharpen the issue is an example from the defenders of communitarianism of a case where loyalty can actually compete with and possibly outweigh universal principles of justice. Isn't that what, that's the test they really need to meet, isn't it? All right, so that's the test you need to meet, or any, any among you who would like to defend obligations of membership or solidarity independent of ones that happen to embody just principles. Who has an example of a kind of loyalty that can and should compete with universal moral claims, respect for persons? Go ahead. Um, yeah, if I were working on an ec problem set, for example, and I saw that my roommate was cheating, that might be a bad thing for, who, for him to do, but I wouldn't turn him in. You Just, would not turn him in? I wouldn't turn him in, and I think that I would argue that's the right thing to do because of my obligation to him. You know, it may be wrong, but that's what I would do, and you know, I think that's what most people would do as well. All right, that's 
Now, there's a fair test. He's not slipping out by saying he's invoking in the name of community some universal principles of justice. What's your name? Stay there. What's your name? It's Dan. 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 So what do people think about Dan's case? That's a harder case for the ethic of loyalty, isn't it? But a truer test? How many agree with Dan? So loyalty, Dan, loyalty has its part of the answer. Um, how many disagree with Dan? <laughs> Peggy. Oh, well, I agree with Dan, but I agree that it's a choice that we make, but it's not necessarily right or wrong. I mean, I'm agreeing that I'm going to make the wrong choice because I'm going to choose my roommate, but I also recognize that that choice isn't morally right. So you're still translating, even Dan's loyalty, you're saying, well, that's a matter of choice. But what's the right thing to do? The, most people put up their hands saying, Dan would be right to stand by his roommate and not turn him in. Yes, go ahead. Also, I think as a roommate, you have insider information and that might not be something you want to use. That might be something unfair uh, to hold against. You know, you're spending that much time with a roommate. Obviously, you're going to learn things about, about him. And I don't think it's fair to reveal that to a greater community. But it's loyalty, Wojtek. You agree with Dan that yes, loyalty is the I, ethic at stake here? Absolutely. You don't have a duty to tell the truth? To report someone who cheated? Not if you're if you've been advantaged into getting that kind of information. Before our critics of patriotism leave, I want to give you another version, a more public example of what we'll, I guess we should call it Dan's dilemma. Dan's dilemma of loyalty. And I want to get the reaction of people to this. This came up a few years ago in Massachusetts. Does anyone know who this man is? Billy Bulger, that's right. Who is Billy Bulger? He was president of the Massachusetts State Senate for many years, one of the most powerful politicians in Massachusetts. And then he became president of the University of Massachusetts. Now, Billy Bulger, did you hear the story about him that bears on Dan's dilemma? Billy Bulger has a brother named Whitey Bulger. And this is Whitey Bulger. His brother, Whitey, is on the FBI's most wanted list, alleged to be a notorious gang leader in Boston, responsible for many murders, and now a fugitive from justice. But when, when the uh, US attorney, they called Billy Bulger, then the president of the University of Massachusetts, before the grand jury, and wanted information on the whereabouts of his brother, this fugitive. And he refused to give it. The US attorney said, just to be clear, Mr. Bulger, you feel more loyalty to your brother than to the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? And here's what Billy Bulger said. I never thought of it that way, but I do have a loyalty to my brother. I care about him. I hope that I'm never helpful to anyone against him I don't have an obligation to help anyone catch my brother. Dan, you would agree. How many would agree with the position of Billy Bulger? Let me give one other example, and then we'll let the critics reply, the critics of loyalty, as we'll describe it. Here's a, an even more fateful example from a figure in American history, Robert E. Lee. Now, Robert E. Lee on the eve of the Civil War was an officer of the Union Army. He opposed secession, in fact regarded it as treason. When war loomed, Lincoln offered Lee to be the commanding general of the Union Army. And Lee refused 
And he described in a letter to his sons why he refused. With all my devotion to the Union, he wrote, I have not been able to make up my mind to raise my hand against my relatives, my children, my home. By which he meant Virginia. The Union is dissolved. I shall return to my native state and share the miseries of my people, save in her defense. I will draw my sword no more. Now, here's a real test, Dan, for your principle of loyalty. Because here is the cause of the war against, not only to save the Union, but against slavery. And Lee is going to fight for Virginia, even though he doesn't share the desire of the southern states to secede. Now, the communitarian would say there is something admirable in that. Whether or not the decision was ultimately right, there's something admirable. And the communitarian would say, we can't even make sense. Rena, we can't make sense of Lee's dilemma as a moral dilemma unless we acknowledge that the claim of loyalty arising from his sense of narrative of who he is is a moral, not just sentimental, emotional tug. All right, who would like to respond? to Dan's loyalty, to Billy Bulger's loyalty, or to Robert E. Lee's loyalty to Virginia. What do you say, Julia? Okay, well, I think that this is, these are some classic examples of you know, multiple spheres of influence and in that you have conflicting communities that your family and your country. I think that's one reason why the idea of choice in your obligation is so important because how else can you resolve this? You have, if you're morally obligated and there's no way out of this need for loyalty to both communities, you're trapped, there's nothing you can do. You have to make a choice. And I think that being able to choose based on other characteristics and merely you know, the arbitrary fact that you're a member of this community is important. Otherwise, it's left to, I guess, randomness. Well, Julia, the issue isn't whether, these, whether Dan makes a choice or Billy Bulger or Robert E. Lee. Of course they make a choice. The question is on what grounds, on what principle should they choose? The communitarian doesn't deny that there's a choice to be made. The question is, which choice, on what grounds, and should loyalty as such weigh? Andre, now you want to. All right, go ahead. What do you say? Well, it, uh, one of the things we've noticed in the three examples is that the people have all chosen the most immediate community of which they're a part, the more local one. And I think there's something to be said for that. It's not just random. There, there, I mean, there doesn't seem to be a conflict because they know which one is more important. And it's their family over the Ec-10 class, their state over their country, and their family over the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I think that's the answer to which is more important. You think that the local, the, the, the more particular, is always the weightier morally, Andre? Well, I mean, there seems to be a trend in the three cases. I, I would agree with that, I think. And I think most of us would agree that your family takes precedence over the United States, perhaps. Which is why you go with Dan. Dan, yes. loyalty to the roommate over Act 10 and the truth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would, because, I mean... I mean truth-telling, not the truth of Act 10. <laughs> yes. All right, so we understand. Yes. But on the same example, in terms of family, you had cases in the Civil War where brother was pitted against brother on both sides of the war, where they chose country instead of family. So I think the exact same war shows that different people have different means of making these choices and that there is no one set of values or one set of morality that communitarians can stick to. And personally, I think that's the biggest problem with communitarians, that we don't have one set of standard moral obligations. And tell me your name. Samantha. So, Samantha, um, you agree with uh, Patrick, Patrick's point the other day, that there may be, if we allow obligations to be defined by community identification or membership, they may conflict, they may, they may overlap, they may compete, and there is no clear principle. Andre says there's a clear principle, the most particular. The other day, Nicola, who was sitting over here, where's Nicola, said, the most universal. You're saying, Samantha, 
the scale of the community as such can't be the decisive moral factor. So there has to be some other moral judgment. All right, let's first, let's let our, defend, our critics of communal patriotism, let's express our appreciation and uh, thank them for their having stood up and responded to these arguments, defined the issue. Let's turn to the implications for justice of the positions that we've heard discussed here. One of the worries underlying these multiple objections to the idea of loyalty or membership as having independent moral weight is that it seems to argue that there is no way of finding principles of justice that are detached from conceptions of the good life as they may be lived in any particular community. Suppose the communitarian argument is right. Suppose the priority of the right over the good can't be sustained. Suppose instead that justice and rights unavoidably are bound up with conceptions of the good. Does that mean that justice is simply a creature of convention? of the values that happen to prevail in any given community at any given time. One of the writings we have among the communitarian critics is by Michael Walser. He draws the implications of justice this way. Justice is relative to social meanings. A given society is just. If its substantive life is lived in a certain way, in a way that is faithful to the shared understandings of the members. So, Walzer's account seems to bear out the worry that if we can't find independent principles of justice, independent, that is, from conceptions of the good that prevail in any given community, that we're simply left with justice being a matter of fidelity or faithfulness to the shared understandings or values or conventions that prevail in any given society at any given time. But is that an adequate way of thinking about justice? Well, Let's take a look at a short clip from the documentary Eyes on the Prize. It goes back in the 1950s in the South. Here are some situated American Southerners who believe in the tradition in the shared understandings of segregation. Listen to the arguments they make about loyalty and tradition and see if they don't make you uneasy about tying arguments about justice to the shared understandings or traditions that prevail in any given society at the moment. Let's run the clip. This land is composed of two different cultures, a white culture and a colored culture, and I've lived close to them all my life. But I'm told now that we mistreated them and that we must change and these changes are coming faster than I expected and I'm required to make decisions on a basis of a new way of thinking and it's difficult. It's difficult for me, it's difficult for all Southerners. Well there you have it. Narrative selves, situated selves, invoking tradition, doesn't that show us that justice can't be tied to the shared understandings of goods that prevail in any given community at any given time? Or is there a way of rescuing that claim from this example? Think about that question and we'll return to it next time. <laughs>